Coming to you from a portable microphone, this is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, hi, this is Dan Balser. Welcome to a very special episode of Don't Get Me Started. This is episode 252, but for me, uh, this is way more. This episode combines two huge parts of my life, advertising and soccer. More specifically, people who work in advertising and Atlanta United. After 10 years of recording these chats, I was nervous to do this one, and I think that's because I want to be up to the standards of this mighty club. So if you're new to the show, here's what this thing is. As you heard in the intro, I'm a creative circus department head. What does that mean? The creative circus is a two-year, fully accredited graduate school for the creative side of advertising, graphic design, photography, and interactive development. I oversee the advertising part, art directors and copywriters who want to have careers building brands and making entertaining, award-winning ads. And we're based in Atlanta, actually about 350 yards from the I-85 bridge collapse, which has been fun. (laughs) I started this podcast as a way to get into the heads and lives of people who build brands for a living. Uh, What's it like to work in a creative field? What have been the mistakes that led to greater things and life lessons learned? I ask questions for this episode from a whole range of people, mostly soccer fans, and a couple of them came back saying, I hate advertising, and I'm hoping that you stuck with this this long and were interested enough in Atlanta United to listen to this. And I just want to say that I know that advertising at its worst, it's an annoyance. It's a video that we have to sit through before we get to the video that we want to sit through. But at its best, advertising and marketing create true bonds between us and the brand's services, even the teams that we love. And through the conversations I had about this, you'll find that that the love of this brand runs runs deep, and I think some of that is accredited to its marketing. All right, so the name of the podcast, Don't Get Me Started, was inspired by my in-class rants. But for this episode, it's particularly appropriate because for the last three years, if someone mentioned soccer in Atlanta or for the last two years, Atlanta United, it would be hard to shut me up. So, okay, let's get to it. In case you don't know what Atlanta United is and you're a regular podcast listener, and there may be a few listeners out there who don't, they are Atlanta's new football team. They play in Major League Soccer, the top tier of professional soccer in North America. And they're an expansion team, meaning they've been playing competitive games for about a month and a half. Atlanta United has taken Major League Soccer by storm. Striker Joseph Martinez earned Goal of the Week, MLS Player of the Month honors in March, and he was featured as FIFA Ultimate Team of the Week player. Miguel Almiron has also earned Goal of the Week honors and has been named to numerous early season MLS Best 11 squads. Not to mention the incredible defense and goalkeeping, keeping the team in games against the league's best opponents, even earning draws against the two Major League Soccer MLS Cup finalists in their buildings in consecutive weeks. Because oftentimes, when I mention that I'm a fan of Atlanta United, people will say, well, are they any good? Yeah, they're good. At this recording, the team sits in fourth place in the increasingly competitive Eastern Conference and has just completed an impressive four-game road stretch. The team is averaging over 50,000 fans per game at home. And at half a million followers, Atlanta United has the most Twitter followers of any Major League Soccer team as an expansion side. Much of its support and fan dedication comes from its marketing team and agency. So let's start with the agency. Chemistry Atlanta handles the advertising for the club. The creative team, Tim Smith and Chris Breen, ran the award-winning Breen Smith for 10 years before Breen Smith became Chemistry Agency. Ad Age Magazine's 2016 Small Agency of the Year for the Southeast in 2016, Breen Smith won pretty much every major advertising award, and they brought the same passion for brands to Chemistry and Atlanta United. Also, and you'll hear a bit about this in our chat, Tim Smith, in collaboration with Blue Sky, another agency in Atlanta, helped create the iconic Blue Land for the Atlanta Thrashers. So on this episode, you'll hear two conversations. First, as an opening act, about 22 minutes with the boys from Chemistry, and then, after I introduce the amazing Skate Knopf singer, a 45-minute look behind the curtain at Atlanta United. We got into the genesis of the Atlanta United brand, how to launch a club without a team, and some insights about Skate herself. I tried to keep this about the team, but I couldn't help 
asking a couple of personal questions about her career and how she ended up in her role. I will say this final thought before we get to the chats. Three years ago, I put down my deposit to be an Atlanta United founding member. Over that span, it would be an understatement to say that I've been emotionally invested in this club. And every step of the way, from the launch party, the launch of the academy, stadium delays, play on the field, and my meeting with Skate, this club has done everything with class, intent, and integrity. It makes me proud to be a supporter, and I hope these conversations add to your experience as fans or, well, just curious ad folk onlookers. First, the conversation with Chemistry Atlanta. All right, first off, thank you guys for agreeing to talk. And it's good to see both of you. Thank Listeners have uh, known these guys for a long, long time, and neither of them really changes. I don't think we all change at all. Anyway, um, let's, let's start off talking a little bit about what is it um, – explain the work that you do for Atlanta United. As an ad agency, what's your role and what's the work that you actually have done? We are their creative agency. So really just sort of from inception, we, we worked with – we pitched the business, work with the um, – you know, their their marketing folks to create the the launch campaign started with the uh, the kit reveal mm-hmm. um, was our first uh, job we did with them, and everything just moved incredibly quickly. The timeline quickly. was super quick from we when we were awarded the job to when we started the work was like ninety days. No, just way sooner than that. It was <laughs> we 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 pitched the business we had. 24 hours to pitch the business. That's right. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay, so the voice that you're hearing talking about 24 hours, that's Chris Breen. He's the creative director. The other voice you're hearing is Tim Smith. He's president of Chemistry Agency, just so you know who's talking. So you had 24 hours? Yeah. All right. One of the questions I was going to ask you is, is this a piece of business that you guys were going for? So this is a piece that you guys wanted to have. Absolutely. This was a choice to pitch them. How many How many different agencies were trying to get this work? Do you know? For there was... Yeah, there was... We don't have an exact number, but... Six or seven. Yeah. Some of the bigger boys in town that are bigger than us, for sure. And sports have always been um, a category that we liked. And between Chris and I, we, we've we worked on basically every, uh, almost every sports team here in Atlanta. We've the, the Dear Departed Thrashers we did for a long time. The Hawks we've done. The Braves we've done for a long time. Uh, but we had never uh, done any of Arthur Blank's the, not the Falcons. So right. this was a great opportunity for us, um, kind of to get in the mix with uh, with Arthur's world, so to speak. It's cool. So um, the kit reveal is something that we know about. So where where would we see your guys' fingerprints or thumbprints? What's the work that you did that people will recognize? And what was your role in those things? What did you actually do? Absolutely. Um, I think well, with the kit reveal in particular, we we had to create a video that was at the um, the actual event. Oh yeah. The, the, the party, um, and that video had to work in both that big crazy room, mm-hmm. you know, at the Tabernacle with five thousand people, but also had to work as a, an online reveal, um, and hopefully be cool enough that it was somewhat shareable. Yeah. Um, so that was the very first, you know, push for mm-hmm. them or effort for that. How did you guys feel it went off? Great, considering yeah. all the nutty variables. There's a lot which of challenges, is, which is crazy. Which yeah. is truthfully the fun part, you know. I think you can always. Like the challenges, you either go, oh, right. you know, this is no fun. It's I a mean, challenge, or, or wow, let's let's use this to our advantage. Right. So For was, any, right. we had no players, no players, no, to, no, no to photography. Work with. No, no, you can kind of tell if you're savvy, but yeah. you guys did a good job of kind of showing right. tight angles of stuff. Right. right. So yeah. listeners that are the regular listeners of the podcast, maybe not Atlanta United fans, I just want to explain what these guys are talking, what we're talking about. So before the team started playing. The team has to have a uniform. Now, I will say this. As a founding member, season ticket holder, and a hardcore fan, um, I'm pretty I'm pretty critical. I'm easy to sort of like be disappointed. I have not been disappointed at one step along the way that this club has done. And the thing that they did for the kit reveal is they rented out the Tabernacle, which is an old church now. It's a live music and live performance venue, downtown Atlanta, a ticketed, free, ticketed event to actually... Re- show and I called it like the shirt show it's basically <laughs> a show with pyrotechnics and an open bar to right. show fans the Atlanta United uniform which sounds absurd and it's kind of awesome kind of awesome right. so that's what we're talking about so in that was this really cool 
sort of opening video that played on YouTube as a video, but for the audience, it was on the screen, right? And the That's smoke right. comes out and the players are revealed behind this wall of smoke. It's just badass. That's right, yeah. So was that any of that your idea or were you tasked with doing, you already knew sort of what the brief was. Did they say, okay, we need a video or did you say, no, we should do a video? How, how did the process work? The process, it was a bit of, of both. It was a bit of a collaboration. They definitely knew they needed something. They needed a video component. Mm-hmm. Um, but we definitely worked with them to, um, one, obviously come up with that concept, but two, um, uh, create one video that could work both online and in the, in, right. in the environment. Right. So it sort of just, like most things, evolved out of almost necessity. Right. Meaning, mm-hmm. okay, we have X budget and X time, and so let's but figure out how Figuring to- out the whole tone of it and really the – Sort of the core of it was, you know, it was all very happening very quickly. And basically, the the stripes on the the on the uniforms uh, and on the logo um, represent railroad tracks. Mm-hmm. And so we started going down that road with railroad. It's really hard, as as you probably know, to get an iconic Atlanta symbol. They tried it with right. the. Olympics and came up with what is it? So this this is railroad it, idea it, yeah. was uh, yeah. So this railroad idea was what we um, sort of clung to and decided you know terminus and that that kind of feel and so built a video out of that and along with um, the Atlanta United team really started talking about you know spikes and right. and uh, togetherness and how that unites mm-hmm. and and so a lot of uh, a lot of ideas kind of developed out of uh, out of that early stuff so what, what what role have you guys had with the golden spike and all of that stuff uh, <laughs> that's a good question no we, that that was something that that um we bounced around a lot of of different ideas around that that was were you tasked with coming up with some ritual, some sort of iconic yeah. thing? Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. And, yeah, including well, at one point we were uh, working on a mascot, which is never uh, – and one of the things was a guy made out of spikes. Uh, but we had some other stuff. <laughs> What's his and, name, Spike? Uh, it yeah. was named was Spike. How did you know? It was very creative um, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, we had all sorts of kind of uh, railroad iconic stuff there. But um, So for the listeners, also the regular listeners, there's a giant – I want to say four and a half, five foot spike that they put out by the bus when the players arrive at the stadium and fans can sign it. The players sign it, the fans sign it, and then right before the game starts, they have a local celebrity with a sledgehammer slam this giant golden spike and get the crowd revved up. And at the end of the game, the sort of local player of the game gets to hammer an actual sort of smaller mm-hmm. golden spike. Right. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, really neat stuff. And I think what's what's been great, and honestly, I think why we won the business was um you know we had a a pretty good understanding or vision for the the tone of the brand it's sort of not your typical um i don't know sports rah-rah brand it's got it's almost a little more i don't know trying to put the counterculture slant on it yeah Yeah. counterculture sort of vibe to it yeah that's cool so so are you guys uh, how does this you mentioned earlier tim that you worked on other atlanta sports um, brands. I was a right. huge Thrashers fan as well. How does this, how does soccer, or you refer to it as Arthur Blank's property, mm-hmm. yeah. how, how does how does it differ from the other experiences, whether it's the sport, the target audience, the ownership? How, how has that experience been totally. different? Yeah, the experience is different, but that that's the word is the experience. You know, the, the Braves, the Thrashers, like when we created Blue Land for the Thrashers, that was all about creating a experience that you go to and being part of this nation Mm -hmm. of fans Um, and same with Braves they're always trying to create the experience so the experience changes to to what you know the, the the team for the team but the key is to create an experience that people understand that experience and go for that experience yeah Blue Land and the two playoff games that they ever had in Atlanta <laughs> was so cool, though. It was cool. I mean, they changed the stanchions yeah. in the glass to be that light blue. Right. It was really, Red really cool. flags. I mean, it, it, whole, like, it was based on Iceland, actually, which uh, was a, from a previous. That's a whole different story. But, um, but it is all about kind of finding what the fans 
respond to, what that culture is, what they care about, and then creating that experience and marketing that experience. And, yeah. So, so were you guys soccer fans? Were you guys fans of this kind of thing, or was this something you had to ramp up your sort of knowledge on? Both. I mean, casual fans. I don't think you'd describe us as – I mean, soccer fans are – as you know, yeah, I do. a whole different breed. I do. Um, but, you know, we've definitely been a lot of learning. Um, yeah. Well, when we started Brain Smith 10 years ago before chemistry, we um, our first client was Fado Irish Pubs, mm-hmm. which has a huge soccer following. Mm-hmm. We had to, that's where we were ramping yeah, up on we, soccer for sure and the culture. All right. So I was told once from Cal McAllister, Wexley School for Girls Agency in Seattle, mm-hmm. that they had practically literally written the book on launching a major league soccer team in 2007 they launched the sounders Mm -hmm. they had uh they had scarves all over town they wrapped the tower with scarves they had scarf giveaway was there a playbook that you guys that the club had or that you guys had that came from the league or came from from any of that or was it something that you guys kind of were doing from scratch i I wouldn't say do it from scratch i'm certainly we're familiar with that Mm -hmm. i think also portland does a real nice job i Mm -hmm. think it's like if we're Working on a shoe brand, you're going to see what the, the other you know what the other brands are doing. Right. So, I wouldn't say a playbook, but I think yeah, they've definitely done a great job and built up a, a, a demand. Um, I'd love to say you know as their agency we deserve a lion's share of the credit, but the truth of it is, um, there's such a, be- a built up demand for soccer here in Atlanta, unbelievable that it, it's kind of like the way I sort of draw the parallels, like when Mini first came to America. Right. I know it's a whole different. Thing, I would but argue, it's like yeah. it's kind of, sort of similar in that it's like you just you 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 let you let it take you where you're supposed to go versus right. trying to that's interesting trying to create this thing that isn't there because it's kind of already there you just sort of and that's know. the thing and, th- and that's the other key is there was a pent up demand but you know Arthur Blank or whoever you want to give the credit to brought in a team yeah with Ann mm-hmm. and Skate and and those folks I mean they weren't messing around they they went and got great people. Who knew what they were doing? Yeah, and that's been the fun part also for us is right. just working with a client that I think we jive so well with. Meaning, that's cool. You know, yeah. they they speak the language. Um, I, this may be a little brown nosy, but I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, but I you remember wouldn't say, in a, you wouldn't say it if it weren't true. Would exactly. You? <laughs> right. No, I certainly wouldn't. But that's I remember being in one of the initial meetings and we were showing stuff, and, and our client said, "That's dope." And I was nice. Like, I think that might be the first time in 20 years in Atlanta. A client. I've heard a client say that. So <laughs> I, will, I will take it. Have they said no to anything yet? Yeah, but it's usually for reasons, you, you know, be, that you are the reasons. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty, um, pretty open. We have a lot of stuff still coming out that should be super cool, uh, you know, in terms of some um, street activation and, cool. and some social stuff. So still yeah. plenty. They, they were smart about it. I mean, they understood the simple design, not trying to do too much, making sure we had the look. Um, that was, you know, could translate from a, a bus to a, you know, to a billboard to a, to a video. So mm-hmm. like the Unite and Conquer wraps yeah, and yeah, those kind of right, things. Yeah. Again, for listeners that are in Atlanta, um, you'll see some buildings in Atlanta, street level stuff where you see one word and the other word around the corner, Unite and Conquer. It's yeah. pretty cool. Um, what's been the most fun working on this piece of business? You were going to say something about Unite and Conquer. I see it. No, well, I just I think it's the most fun has been honestly as a selfishly is just seeing how much how crazy people yeah. are for the brand. Crazy, like yeah. like again, it's 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 fun. The ball's rolling downhill or the mm. rock or whatever the expression mm. is. Meaning, um, you know, uh, like my favorite piece of creative that we've done, and it'll probably be the only time in my career I ever say this is we did these bus wraps, and the buses look like something out of Mad Max. It's like these prison buses. They look <laughs> they do. totally gangster. And it's pretty like pretty sure I have one on my phone. Uh, yeah, uh, picture of it. Cool. Yeah, and it's like I've never again as a creative. You want you want to do an amazing video Conceptual, or an amazing this, yeah. but right. it's like the, the all the little connective pieces you see around town. Right, that's right. You know, that's the fun part for me is like sitting in a pub and you see. People owning it. It's not just you know uh, a slogan that's thrown out there. It's like there is a definite sense of pride, um, you yeah, know, that I'm the city, yeah. city feels, and I think that carries through to the in-game experience. And I think it's everything from you know, it's a whole different experience. It's not quite as corporate as a lot of other sports experiences, and I think that that carries through the advertising, the the in-game experience, sort of. All the way through. Right. Okay, as an advertising writer, I'm curious does your does your approach to it as creatives when you're solving problems differ from your other more I don't want to say traditional, but your your other 
clients? Is it a different mindset or are you applying the same sort of craft to it? And that's This isn't another, sure. it's maybe too granular for the no, no, United no. fans, but I'm curious about how you approach it for, as a creative. Yeah, I, I think this, the general rules are the same. I think there's definitely what what is so awesome is it is a very, right out of the gate, their tone is so defined oh, that like you know whether that fits in, in the is that lane. Li- is that liberating for you or is that limiting for you? I think it's liberating. I think it, it lets you, it's just so much easier to know what's right for the brand and what's not. Right. And that's, that's cool. And especially a brand new brand. That's the cool part is like, wow, they've, and they, we spend a lot of time together, you know, making sure both parties were, you know, totally making sure we were speaking the same language. And I think it's it's really yeah. helpful. And that you can see it immediate, you see the immediate results where with sales, you know, the ultimate with right. everything sales. So you're selling whatever. And yes, sales go mm-hmm. up and you say, I'm sorry, these, you're, you you know, we're people are walking around the agency going, we got 3,000 tickets left and we got two weeks, What you know, and you can see them clicking off, you know, and it's it's pretty nice. It's yeah. pretty fun. You don't have 3,000 tickets. No, <laughs> no, not anymore. I'm saying not anymore. Not anymore. We've we're sold out three games. It's it's, But that's, you can see that you literally can see the sales ticking away and it's fantastic. That's yeah. cool. And, and, you know, again, the, the, the thing that was probably most motivating to us from the get-go was when they came to us, they said, we're not worried about selling tickets this season, we're about worried about creating fans right. for you know That's years to come. Very, very smart. So it's a it's a the ticket sales will happen if you create the fans, and I think it's a whole you know having like Tim mentioned worked on a number of sports brands, right. not only just locally but other you know in other markets. It is such a you know a retail sometimes experience. Well, well, I'm ask about um, that a little bit. Yeah. Retail and again for the, for the soccer fans, that means that there's sort of a um, expectation of, of return, immediate return, and the sort of a t- tight timelines and those kind of things where there's very specific things that advertising needs to accomplish. I'm curious, just because I'm completely ignorant to this kind of account, one of the things that impressed me, and you were talking, Chris, about the environment, when we saw the first game at Bobby Dodd, Georgia Tech, the stadium seats go up at an angle, and there was a banner that's perfectly fit into that, like, Mm-hmm. diagonal top that came mm-hmm. down and was horizontal at the bottom. The stadium felt like an Atlanta United stadium. It yeah. was really well done. Was, right. was the agency involved in that? Is the club doing that? Are you guys executing any of those kind of in-game things? I'd love to take a ton of credit for that, but mostly it was their internal folks. We created the whole look. And but isn't it cool that I can't tell the difference? Like yeah, as a fan, absolutely. Or, like, they no, and seamless partnership. partnership. And I, you should mention mm-hmm. that to, to Skate because she'll get a kick out of that because mm-hmm. I know that was um, we, you know a lot – it was a lot of, of her doing. Right. Yeah, it was funny. We actually, the last last time we were sitting there, Brain turned around and he was like, wait a second, that's our print ad. And they turned one of our print ads into this massive poster up beside us. Yeah, Poster's the wrong cool. word. But, and, yeah, but and, it, yeah, go and ahead. it is, it is, it, it's a, a unique process and how we work with them. It is fast and furious in the sense that, you know, they – Work. It's just constantly churning, whether it's social or print right. or this or right. that. We have a that. great idea coming out that we're about to film, and and it's gonna. Hope it, it should be a lot of fun, and I'd love to reveal it right here. Yeah. Except we're gonna get in When's trouble if we do. When's it coming? I'd say probably Juneish. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's gonna be one of my questions was: there anything about the marketing and advertising that fans would love to know? What would fans love to know that that isn't apparent, that's not obvious, other than what we've talked about? Is there anything? Not, I'm not talking about specific sure. executions, but there's... Sure, yeah. Uh, well, I think what... The, and this is ultimately what is super cool um, about the brand. I think what they, they kind of get as, as a whole, or we kind of get as a whole, is the whole original positioning was all formed around like, hey, Atlanta isn't, you know, the tourist version of Atlanta. Atlanta's all these cool little neighborhoods. And it's sort of that, that element just below the surface that makes... People who live here, you know, that's why they love it. And mm-hmm. I think that element gets carried through in, in as much just sort of in the overall tone of, of how we speak as it is, you know, literally calling out the different neighborhoods. But that to me was was the the sort of uh, linchpin, if you will. It's that, yeah. that what separates this brand maybe from some other Atlanta sports brand is, is it's not, I don't know, as finely polished and, mm-hmm. and they're okay with that. I think the way we were like to refer to it is it's it's grit and flash. 
Like it's a bit of both. It's it's yeah. not. And I think of it as, as sort of a soil that things are going to come out of. I remember the club talking about the name being sort of open-ended. There's no club defining the, a mascot or club defining tradition. Or, right. uh, and that that the, the name is, is open-ended, but also uniting a, a community of, of sort of disparate neighborhoods where, mm -hmm. and I love this part, where every kid, and I've got a 12-year-old son, all of his friends have parents who are Giants, Red Sox right. fans right. of all these different sports, right. uh, 49ers, Patriots, but none of them are loyal to like Columbus Crew or, mm -hmm. or right. Earthquakes. Mm -hmm. right. So this is the team that unites generations, unites cultures, yep. and the name kind of fits. I, I was sort yeah. of like, I didn't like the European yeah. uh, right. sort of construct of the name, but now it's totally growing on me. Right. Who who came up with the name and who designed the logo? Do you guys know? Tim Smith. No. Adidas. <laughs> um, no, I, Adidas. Um, I know Adidas came Adidas. up with, well, they worked with Adidas on, on the logo. As far as the name itself, uh, that predates us. The club. Yeah. yeah. Right. But um, it's certainly... You know, Adidas. you're exactly right in the sense of, um, you know, that that whole united sort of uh, feel makes perfect sense in terms of the the, the neighborhoods I saw it. and pride. We've seen and it at ownership. the game too. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, yeah. the, how disparate and diverse the crowd is. And and I don't. The only thing I haven't seen a lot of here's a little here's a little insight for the yeah. agency. What I haven't seen a lot of high school age kids. That's the only thing I didn't see at the stadium. Yeah, and probably because it was during the school year. We'll see what happens yeah. in the summer. Yeah, because so, kids are a big push for sure. Because part of the whole yeah. making fans, a lot of younger, is, younger kids, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot that's of younger kids. Yeah. yeah, but the high school, yeah, that's a. Well, I will say this as we wrap up because someone's knocking on the on the conference room door. Um, <laughs> I've been impressed with the club's decisions to hire Darren Eels, Carlos yep. Bocanegra. Absolutely, um, chemistry agency is right up there with it now for me. Good. Uh, really love that you guys are buying it. I think as a fan, I'm happy to know that. The marketing is, you know, this is a tough thing. This gets a little advertising-y. It's tough yeah. sometimes to believe in your brands. Yeah. It is. It is. It, you're lucky if you get to work on a brand that you have heart for. Absolutely. That's right. And to yeah. be able to do that and also get out of your own way, not speak to yourself, but right. do things that work for your target audience. And as advertising people, you know what I'm talking about. That's sometimes true. I don't want to work on, I don't want to work on FIFA for EA because I just, it gets in the way for me, the That's things right. I know. But there is a really beautiful balance between the work you're doing and the club's doing, and I wish you guys all the best, and thank you so much for talking with, Appreciate with me Appreciate today. it. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Chris us. Chris Breen and Tim Smith. So that was my talk with the guys from Chemistry Atlanta. If you want to get a hold of them or see more from the agency, check out createareaction.com. Now on to the conversation with Skate. I first contacted Skate Knopf Singer in November of last year, hoping, maybe, she would say yes to talking to me about the marketing and advertising at Atlanta United. Um, I finally got to meet her, and I will say this, uh, I was humbled. Um, Skate is uh, world-class and extremely impressive. Um, she mentioned in our chat that she left soccer for a while. Um, she left to go to remote district of South Africa, where as director of sport leadership and sustainability for the Triad Trust, she started a youth soccer league to educate African youth and test for HIV. Prior to that, she graduated from Wake Forest with a BA in Anthropology and Sociology, and she received her Continuing Study Certificate from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. Skate was a 1997-98 Gatorade Virginia Girls Soccer Player of the Year, an All-American, All-ACC midfielder at Wake Forest University, and became the first Wake Forest female student athlete to be drafted by a professional sports team when she was drafted by their Washington Freedom in 2002. She's worked for the U.S. Soccer Federation. She's co-founder of Inspire Transformation, a nonprofit designed to create sustainable, positive social change through sport, music, counseling, and other culturally relevant activities. And before joining Atlanta United, Skate spent six years as commissioner of Elite Clubs National League, the nation's top league for elite female soccer players in the United States, and a breeding ground for the U.S. women's national team. I've worked in advertising since 1988, and it's safe to say that I've never worked for a client who is better able to articulate the brand that they work for than Skate is. She exudes confidence, intelligence, and realistic determination. She has internalized the truth of what Atlanta United stands for and what it means to us, the supporters. I would say this with great gratitude. Thank you, Skate, for allowing the conversation. Thank you to the club for allowing her to sit with me for 45 minutes. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this. 
I appreciate that very much. I am humbled and excited for this. That's what skate sounds like on the other end. Um, <laughs> let's start off with just the job um, at Atlanta United. How did you, let's, let's ask you first of all, how did you end up at Atlanta United? How did you end up in this role? And um, at what stage did you come in? How did I end up in this role? I think it's that, that story would probably be longer than this podcast, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Um, you know, I think even a, I've always said even a blind squirrel finds a nut. And that's kind of <laughs> what I equate myself to. Um, I was loving what I was doing. I guess it was a little over two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, loved what I was doing. I uh, was the commissioner of the Elite Clubs National League, which was the elite platform for female soccer in the U.S. Yep. Um, and I, I ended up in a conversation with one of the people here at Atlanta United at the time. They had uh, three full-time employees. Yeah, wow. It's Yeah, so, you know, it was kind of a friend, you know, Ann Rodriguez, who's the VP of Business Operations, mm-hmm. had reached out and asked if I knew of anyone. And uh, we got to talking, and one thing led to another. Next thing you know, I'm down here interviewing. Um, and the first thing I did when I got here was you know, drive downtown. And Ann laughs, too, because she said, did the exact same thing. We both drove downtown, made sure there was a stadium being built. Right. Yeah, you know, make sure is this real. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure Tata Martino's thought the same thing. And I think, Wait a minute here. <laughs> yeah. And then uh went up and met with everyone and, you know, next thing I knew I was packing up my life in Richmond, Virginia and, you know, leaving my baby of the E C N O that right. I absolutely loved and coming down here for this project. That's it's interesting. I was gonna ask you about the the E C N L. So six years as commissioner for the elite clubs Grew the league to 79 clubs, over 10,000 players. Um, now the nation's top soccer league for young women, a breeding ground for the U.S. women's national team. So now, where do you put Major League Soccer in the global scale of football leagues? And do you feel like part of the role here is to grow MLS as well as Atlanta United? Is that something that, it, that you guys are cognizant of, or is it really just focused on the club? Yeah, you know, with my background, I'm cognizant of we all have a commitment to to grow the level or to grow the game in the United States mm. and to raise the level of the game in the United States. Um, we're all part of something that's much greater than ourselves. And so it is something that we think about regularly. Yeah, we have a commitment to Atlanta, but we also have a commitment to the game. That's and, interesting. You know, and that's what, you know, for me, I knew at an early, an early age that whatever, quote, job I had was – I wanted to make sure there was like always the giving back component. What does that and mean, the, quote, job? Job. <laughs> Why do you do job in air quotes? Job. Because a job, I mean, we, we you know, spend as much time working as we do sleeping, hopefully. Right. So you got to enjoy what you do. Right. And a job shouldn't just be work that you wake up every morning. And if you wake up multiple mornings thinking, why am I doing this? And right. I'm unhappy doing this, then you shouldn't be doing it. So. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I think that's a very good it's point. It's crazy, though. There's people I know that really don't enjoy what they do. I'm like, how do you get up every day and go do it? Right. The worst part of my day by far is getting here. Yeah. Well, for you, yes. <laughs> for me, this, this was rough getting down here today. All right, so that, that, that is, um, kind of leads me to a question I got from one of, uh, from a friend, I should say a listener sent in the question, but Kyle Cavanaugh is a, another advertising professional, huge soccer fan, lives in Seattle. Um, how much soccer education did you guys feel like you needed to do? Was it... Um, do you think that there's a, there's any of that sort of communication coming out of here that kind of explains the game to the Atlanta soccer fan as part of growing the sport? Is that do you think that's part of what has to be done? Of, of course, you know Atlanta. Anytime you're building a new brand, um, first part of that is building a culture, and there's an education and awareness component of it. And for us, you know, when we initially started mapping out where we were going, what we wanted to do, the first thing we had to do was figure out who we were and what we stood for. And then in doing that, too, at the same time, there's the education component of putting a story together that people that love Atlanta are going to love Atlanta United and then people that love soccer are going to love Atlanta United. So you have to weave that together. And there's a balance of, you know, catering to your kind of avid supporters and then, you know, raising awareness to everyone else. There's a difference between supporters and fans. Because you can't, you've never heard of fair weather supporter. There's no such, There's thing. No such thing as a fair weather supporter. <laughs> you're a supporter um, or you're a fan. And a fan is sort of someone who, who kind of roots when it's convenient, right? And a supporter lives and dies. Is that probably true? You know, I think in Atlanta, one of the things, you know, for me, I'm committed to doing is it's kind of, it's unleashing that inner passion. Because at the end of the day, everyone's a supporter at heart. 
Hmm, interesting. That's very cool. So you said a second ago, you said that you wanted to sort of map out who we are and what we stand for. Who who determines that? Where do, who is sort of the keeper of the brand? Who is the keeper of the brand? The fans are the keeper of the brand. Interesting. Um, you know, first thing about building a brand, it isn't about building a, a legion of followers. It's about knowing who you are and what you stand for. Mm-hmm. And so for... For us, when I first got here, it was it was truly diving into that and understanding what does the city stand for, what is the people that love about Atlanta, and how do we fit into this how landscape? Do you, how do you figure that out, coming from Richmond? This coming time. from Richmond, that's a good question. Uh, in my last life, I basically got my brand and marketing education crash course from Nike. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that makes them so good at what they do is insight gathering. So they spend so much time out in the field talking to people, understanding you know, behaviors, tendencies, wanting, knowing what their consumers want before they know they want it. Very and so when I got here, I spent a heck of a lot of time outside talking to people. Do you like that part of it? The insight gathering? Mm-hmm. Of course. I mean, marketing is relationships. Marketing is understanding people and, you know, having a consistent relationship with them and, and being willing to adapt and evolve. So I don't remember where the, what the question initially was, but you know, for us, it was about insight gathering and but figuring that out. That was a, that was the answer because the question was about who who decides. I think that's really interesting. I think people don't realize that. I think that the casual fan or the casual consumer thinks that a brand might sit in a room like this. We're in a conference room at Georgia World Congress Center, and some executives and the owner will say, "I want this to be." this right? right this is what i think we are right. it's like well you kind of have to have a conversation first with the people you're talking to right so it's I, helpful yeah. it's helpful so when you say the fans determine it it's not that the fans are now actively determining what the advertising and marketing says but the fans determine the direction that they they're the compass that you follow right is that right. a fair way yeah of that's it? that's a great they're you know they're they're a compass and we have to stay ahead of the compass mm-hmm. and we have to know what you know what they want and what they need before they know they want and need it and the only way you can do that is to be out immersed in the community and have conversations and listen and respond to what they need and uh you know atlanta united like we're committed to being you know the best and most passionate club in the world and that's ultimately where we want to go and i love that i mean that's 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 atlanta united and then we're committed to delivering that passion, inspiration, and world-class soccer to Atlanta. And in doing so, we say our promise is to unite and entertain the city. To unite and entertain the unite city. Unite and entertain the city. And if we can't, you know, if we don't know what people want before they want it, if we and we don't know who we are and what we stand for, then there's no way we can deliver that. Do you think about that often? Do you, is that in your mind, unite and entertain the city? Is that some, something that you kind of run in, through your mind like a mantra when you guys are producing pieces or making content? Every day. Every day, actually. So, you know, one of the, you know, around here, we have a, a briefing process. Uh, but we couldn't have that briefing process if we didn't know, again, back to, like, who we are, what we stand for, what we're trying to yeah. accomplish. So we spend a lot of time, every single thing that you see that goes out the door for us is we've got, we do our insights, understand what the opportunity is, and then we figure out, okay, what are we trying to accomplish here? And then we, we figure out... Uh, you know, essentially, here's the steps that are going to get us there. And if what we're trying to do isn't going to help us accomplish, you know, the overarching objective, then, you know, we'll bag the project. Interesting. So for us, it's, you know, we've got a pretty clear process about, and, and we're very mindful of what we're trying to do and making sure that everything is, is pretty plotted out. That's cool. Um, I meant to say this at the beginning, but I, I'm new at this. <laughs> You're not new at this. You're a veteran. <laughs> Ten years, right? Right. Something like that. I'm, being I'm tr- new at this. Trying to be self-deprecating. Um, so every, I meant to say this at the beginning. Everything is so good. So good. The, the brand expression is so good. And I'm not saying that just as an advertising guy. I've talked about this with other fans. Hey, listen, listeners, if you disagree, let me know. Send me an email. I just think that it's just done with so much intent and integrity and it's been it's just been a, a really a pleasure to to kind of be a consumer on the other end of it how does that how does that happen to decide to kill pieces or that what something doesn't fit like who who's involved in that in that conversation who is is i guess this goes back to the question who's keeping who's the keeper of the who's brand who's the keeper of the brand so you know essentially the the driver of the brand is are the fans you know okay. they determine so how do you so have, you, have there been missteps? Have there been things that of you've Of course. Right? If you don't fall on your face, you don't know what works mm-hmm. and what doesn't. So 
you know, if we if we knew what worked, we would never fail because we'd never we never go that way. Right. Probably wouldn't push very far either if you weren't failing. Right. So it's always an educated rolling of the dice. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, we spent a lot of time inside gathering, and initially when I got here, we spent spent a few months literally just out talking to people. Like I said, so we could put together a story that would you know unite the people that love soccer and unite the people that love Atlanta and weave them together as one. Um, in doing that, we put together this roadmap and we said, okay, if we want to, you know, be the destination for soccer fans in the world, which Atlanta has the opportunity to do, let's let's put that roadmap together. It's not just going to be a one-year thing. It's not going to be a five-year thing. It could be even longer process, but let's start that roadmap. Um, and the first thing we had to do was start building that cultural identity. And we plotted everything out. We plotted, you know, building this fan base um, you know, the first year we had no games. So it's unbelievable that I'm. So, so that was that was. So I've, been a, I've been a fan for three over three years, right? Three years. How long has it been since I've watched a soccer game? It's like three months, uh, two months. So, like for the first two, two, two almost three years, yeah, I feel like no I'm games. a fan of a team I can't even name a player for. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. You know, where you know everything has been. I like to say intentional, like mm-hmm. I said. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, that first year without having any games, you're supposed to be building the sports brands, but you have no matches, mm-hmm. which are supposed to be, you know, your, your major moments, um, you know, those physical touch points. So we had to find a way to, you know, engage and dominate people's lives without having that. Right. And so that's where we started to build Atlanta United as a lifestyle versus just a game day brand. Right. And... You know, we did that through grassroots events, viewing parties, but those were also opportunities to help us build the culture, really dive in with those supporters, identify them, beginning to begin to communicate with them and begin to speak in a language that everything that they saw felt like Atlanta United. That's cool. And and that, that the first year was you know, or last year leading up to our launch year was was really where we focused was those supporters. Because in order to create a culture we needed to understand what they were doing, help kind of you know, guide them along, steer the ship. And essentially, you know, we said we were going to create a culture. That was last year. You know, obviously it takes more than one year to create a culture, but I was actually joking around some people the other day. It was, you know, were we creating a culture or were we just a mechanism to unleash a culture that was already Right, that's what I was wondering. I didn't say this when I talked to Chris and Tim, but it felt to me a little bit like dropping a match in some dry dry, uh, fuel. In a way, there's sort of there's so much latent demand for this in Atlanta, and it kind of feels like all you were doing is activating it in a way. But there is a way to You're screw right. that up too. Oh, there's definitely it's it's a lot easier to screw things up than it is to do them well. That's for sure. Yeah. So Will Thompson, another listener who's a advertising professional in New York, native Atlantan, asked the question about activation through the supporters groups. Mm-hmm. Was there a relationship leading up to the launch of the first? game with supporters groups is that something that you guys kind of focus on or work with of course collaboration is key mm-hmm. for everything uh, okay. like i said it's a fan first mentality around here um you know and they are our most avid supporters most passionate fans and so last year kind we of were, disturbing at a certain level right oh, God, <laughs> that's what makes soccer so cool is like the uh, yeah. fans if you go to a match they drive the experience what goes on in the stands and i think it's so cool i read something where they said where there was, in, I think it was the Chicago, it must have been the Chicago game, where they were yelling Atlanta, and the rest of, it was a call and response, and the rest of the building would yell United back. It was absolutely chilling. Was. And I read, read something somewhere where one of the guys from Terminus Legion said, they're learning it. They learned it. It's like they're training these 40,000 mice to respond back. And it caught so quickly. It's amazing. It's just amazing. Um, question about also sort of developing it from the beginning and leading up to the launch is there guidance from Major League Soccer? Is the league involved in any ways or a template that you guys follow? Or are you guys kind of starting at this fresh? Um, you know, the United States is a big country, so you, you can't do the same thing in every single city. Every, single, every city here is different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the league has been outstanding with support, with collaboration, with questions. Uh, you know, they believed in Atlanta, otherwise we wouldn't have gotten the franchise here mm-hmm. uh, or expansion club here. But... You know, the other, you know, the biggest surprise to me has been how open and supportive the other clubs in MLS have been in that first year, being able to reach out and ask questions, oh. whether it's, you know, again, you said, mentioned Seattle earlier, or Portland or whomever it may be, but, 
them willing to offer advice of you know best practices or hey try to avoid this or try to avoid this and then it's up to us to take all that feedback um we're not reinventing the wheel we're just bringing the wheel to atlanta but having to tailor it to meet the people here and what the city needs make it into the wheel of a locomotive there you there you go we like <laughs> to say it's not a it's not a bandwagon it's a freight train there you go I call myself the uh, I call myself the hood ornament on the front of the bandwagon. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if I should freight train freight train. What's that? A cow cow catcher? Is that what they call that on the front of a freight train? That big thing that would push the I think it's called. A cow. I have absolutely no idea. I think that's what I it's need called. to to look that up. A cow catcher. Um, so a couple of things I was I wanted to personally ask you about. Number one, Flag Friday. Is that something? That Flag you, Friday. You guys come up with that in, in house. We did. Uh, Flag Friday actually was a. You know, Atlanta, when you're understanding, we're building the culture here. And like I said, we spend a lot of time inside gathering. And one of the things that we saw was if you drive through the different neighborhoods here, um, flags are everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. And so it was, if we're building a club here that needs to resonate with people that love soccer and people that love Atlanta, again, like I said, weaving that story together to unite both, we found flags to be a unifying symbol. And in building a culture, we need those symbols. And we went after the flags. The first time we ever brought flags out was the Mexico-Paraguay game last, I think it was Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And we activated there, and we had a bunch left over, and we're sitting around, like, you know, it started out. We got the summertime. Last summer, it was, hey, let's do this every Friday. Mm -hmm. And it it turned out, actually, I think it was June 14th, maybe, is National Flag Day. So I'm sitting there looking at all these flags, and I'm looking at my team, like, we got to do something with these, and it's got to be fun. And, you know, so we started doing scavenger hunts and little stuff last summer to see what works what wouldn't work and a couple times we fell on our face and then a couple times you know you learn from it and you just don't make the same mistake twice and then now it's evolved and you know the coolest thing is to to drive around the city and you see flags windows apartments in front of houses garden flags you see everything and then you see them at the match too so you're seeing it like i said it's a lifestyle and a match day i love that i love it because um it's so, so for listeners that aren't familiar with what we're talking about. So on Friday mornings, I want to say it was seven thirty a.m. <laughs> right? Is that something? Is that right? It, it was. It was brutal. It, it was really early. Atlanta United would post on social a little map of a park or somewhere that there would be flags, and, you, and you'd run out to these parks, and there would be these little black Atlanta United yard flags, and random random flags would have swag taped to the back of it. And, Literally taped, and sometimes it, stapled. <laughs> and it was so cool because my son and I saw it every week, and uh, his school happens to start an hour later on Friday. So the very last week, it was at the park that I drive through to take him to school. So I'm like, let's go now. Get your lunch. Put your shoes on. We're going yes. down there. Yeah, we found him. It was really – he was fired up. So cool. You but, know, the first time we did that, you know, everyone, you always have those insecure moments. Right? Is anyone going to show up for this? Mm-hmm. And they were gone within like five minutes. It was unbelievable. You know, I'm calling the other guys saying, hey, you guys got flags. No, skate, they're gone. Wow. Wow, okay. So then we just, we continue to drive that. And that's one of the, it's become a symbol of the club. Yeah, it's really cool. What about, okay, speaking of symbols of the club, what, talk about the, the um, genesis of the Golden Spike. The Golden Spike. The Golden Spike. So I'm, I don't know how many listeners might might know this uh i actually didn't know it until i got to atlanta and really started learning and studying the city and understanding it essentially atlanta you know historians say would not exist today if that decision hadn't been made to make the railroad 100 years ago that connected basically the midwest to the east coast southeast and you know they they picked this area that is now named atlanta initially it was called terminus once all the it was like five different towns came together um you know, so understanding that, and that is that was a you know a tipping point, so to speak, for Atlanta. Um, it's hard to make Thomas the Train bold, <laughs> sexy, right. inspirational. Yeah. That's tough. And yeah. so, if you're looking at, at Thomas the Train, it's okay. What else is there? And knowing what our history is, and knowing that if the people of Atlanta that actually built these railroad tracks and made a decision themselves to continue to build the tracks to continue to connect the city. Um, you know, there's a, a gritty feel to that. And, you know, a railroad wouldn't stand if it didn't have the spikes holding mm-hmm. it together. And, you know, looking at the at the spike, you know, it's a strong, bold symbol that, you know, for us, you know, the it stands for every person in Atlanta. It, it stands for, you know, the, the past, the present, and the future. So the next generation as well. And before every match, we've got this massive golden spike that 
anyone and everyone that's at the match can come up and sign, which cool. is pretty neat. So you oh, see that. signed it. You, oh, you signed oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the players, the staff, I mean, everyone signs it. And it's, it's a... It's become a fun tradition. It's cool, fan. It, it, listeners, it's really cool because the, the players will get off the bus and the, and the spike sits there sort of roped off. The players get off the bus and walk up to the spike and there's like little holders with Sharpies in it and the players all sign it. And then when the players go into the stadium, the fans that are out there greeting the players get to walk up there and then sign their name right next to the players' names. It's really, that's really cool. And then the, the supporters carry it into the stadium and that's become a... It's actually become almost a signature moment before a match. You know, people are getting in the stands to see the supporters bring this thing in, and then, you know, they hammer it in. We've had two home games, by the way. We, oh, had, I know. we, we already had a signature big, moment. A signature <laughs> moment, right? Man. Um, so was there a need to have a spike-type object? Did you feel like we have to have this sort of seminal, iconic thing? Well, it's funny. People kept asking, what's your, what's your mascot? That's a question we still get. It's so American. It's so, right? It's so American. Mm-hmm. Um and the last thing you want to do is have this fluffy, furry mascot. You can either have a mascot or you can have a hero. So you can have a mascot that's fluffy, friendly, warm, fuzzy, or you got a hero that people look to for behavior, like guidance. How about Joseph Martinez? Maybe he's our he's, hero. He's our hero? Yeah. He, hey, there's a lot of heroes <laughs> out there. Um, you know, so that wasn't – we didn't we didn't necessarily feel we had to have one. Right. We felt it was something that needed to evolve. And again, like I said, the insight gathering and understanding the city and knowing sports and being able to, to build a moment prior to the match that really unifies everyone and brings them together, the fans, the players, everyone that's in this venue for that shared experience. You know, the spike, it just started making sense and it, it resonates with the fans and it seems, I mean, it's been two matches, but it seems to have taken off. Yeah, it's cool. Um, Kyle also asked the question, Kyle Cavanaugh also asked the question, do you feel like there's a need for a rival? Has that ever come up where, like, we want to think about, okay, who are we, we going to identify as a rival, or is that something that just kind of comes organically out of the fan base? I mean, human nature, we're all competitive, and we need rivals. A lot. I mean, we are, we're very competitive human beings. Um, so d- does that ever so, get yes. into the marketing? I mean, we, we, rivals? Uh, they naturally evolve, and, I, you know, before you look back, naturally what's going to happen, Orlando is essentially the closest market. Mm-hmm. And so there is a rivalry there. They do some really, really great things. Uh, are, they got calling, a, are they calling their stadium the litter box, or is that just what we're calling it? Uh, I will not respond on that one, <laughs> but that is fantastic. Um, Did they call it the Purple Palace or something? The Purple Palace, the litter box. I, I am, you know, I'll, I'll remove myself from that one. Okay. But it's... Uh, it's a fun, healthy rivalry. Any rivalry you have in sports is, is outstanding. I think there's going to be a number of rivalries geographically. Yes, it's Orlando. Um, you, know, you got DC, you know, United. You got Minnesota United who came in at the same year we did. Um, it's tough when you hammer them so hard, though, to make that feel like a rivalry. Yeah, that's what's crazy about the sport. You know, you can, you never know. You never know. You right? never know. <clears throat> um, all right, so. I'm going to go back for a second to making the big club. So recently, actually, Carlos Bocanegra, who's the Atlanta United Sporting Director, said, we have big goals. We'd like to be the biggest club in America. We'd like to sort of follow in the Sounders' footsteps and try to take it even a level beyond. So does that put pressure on you? Or does that fire you up? Like, what, when you hear something like that coming from the club, how does that affect your mindset and your job? You know, pressure can bust a pipe or it can make a diamond. That's about all you need to say. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> there we go. Um, they ever excited. I, I like I said, it's you know it can bust a pipe or it can make a diamond, and great. you know we we strive, like I said, to to be the best and most passionate club in the world. That's great. So um, t- changing gears a little bit, how do you guys make the things you make? Do you have an in-house team with cameras, writers, all that? Because the content, like I said before, not just saying it to flatter you. I think it's just so cool. I think. You know, as a fan, I'm on social media following the club, and I'll see these videos of just a training session that are beautifully produced, beautiful. And I love the fact that we're getting like, it's almost like when you're a kid and you kind of, someone leaves out snacks for you. There's snacks every day for the, for the fans. Who's making that? How is that happening? Yeah, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a collaborative effort. Um, we're, it's a small team internally. So when you see some of the day-to-day content like that, it's it's an internal team. We've got some incredibly young, talented guys on our digital team. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see where their careers are going to take them. We're lucky to have them right now. That's great. Um, you know, 
when it comes to the actual content that's going out there, we always look for the intent behind it. And is it going to help us move the needle? Is it going to resonate with the fans? And there's some, you know, filters and questions that we, that we ask every time we put one of those out, believe it or not. Hmm. And, you know, there's a number, there's a bunch of content that's never even made it out the door, but it's because we have that commitment to making it, we got to make sure it fits our filter. Hmm. Um, but that being said, too. But tapping every day. I mean, someone's out there right now shooting something probably. Every day we've got. Yep. And it's not you would think it's a mass. It's a very small team. Mm-hmm. Very, very small team. How but, small? Oh, for internal, I mean, less than less than 10. But that's marketing, digital, and comms all put together. Wow. It's a small team. But, you know, you, you work hard, do great things. And we all, like I said, we're all competitive. We all strive to be great. And I love helps. it. I even love the little audio visual sort of shoot thing at the very end of the video. The click, the click. it's really nice. It's the, the you know, it's the train. Oh, that's that. So as we were, I'm so that's the that. hammer and the spike at the end. That's cool. That's a, I just you might have just made my day that you recognize that because that was a little cue building up. We started that in oh, I'm all over that in February, and it was one of those subtle ways as we were introducing the spike. Let's slowly start getting people to think about it. We started actually back at the kit launch video mm-hmm. if you listen to that you're going to hear there's a mm-hmm. the hammering noise mm-hmm. um we showed some footage we went back and forth that's when we introduced the mantra of unite and conquer and you went back and forth and you could hear you know the the hammering in of a spike so that was the first introduction and you kind of let it resonate with everyone and then you know we made made the choice in in february to start okay what's the next step in this evolution so we're not throwing something at people let's let it evolve let's see if it catches hold and you just made my day. That's cool. Yeah. Well, the agency talked about that that was their first job was working on the kit yeah. launch video. And it's so, a great story behind the guy in the kit video, too. It's completely 100% Atlanta. Oh, that's cool. Like, I mean, his story is... Who is it? What do you mean? Uh, you know, Atlanta is it's one of the most diverse cities in our country, and it is a melting pot of cultures, backgrounds, everything. And so we've made a commitment, just like when now we're talking about the agency, uh, we made a commitment early on that we are a reflection of this city. So everything we do, it's not about me. It's not about Darren. It's not about, you know, we've got one of the greatest owners in all of sports or in any industry. And it's, like I said, it's a fan first mentality here. And so making sure that everything we do, it's fans, it's people of Atlanta, they're strategically placed throughout this because we know players are going to come and go, but right. the fans are going to always right. you know, remain loyal and the city's never going to go. Mm-hmm. So in that kit video, we actually, it's a, uh, a young man that was uh, relocated here from Africa, from Western Africa. Mm-hmm. He's got an incredible story, um, kind of stumbled onto him and then got him in there. And soccer is a sport that actually helped him in his transition That's moving cool. over here. And That's so cool. soccer was his game. And now he's actually, he, you know, he models, he's in fashion, he does all that stuff. Right. But soccer is what helped him, he said, get through his teenage years. And so... For him, he actually was like almost in tears at the end of this kit video that he got to be a part of this of the city that he now calls home. Oh, that's amazing. So, that is really, really cool. So let's talk about the marketing partnerships. What do you expect from those relationships? How do they go well? How do they go badly? We're talking about working with outside designers, agencies, those kind of things. Like, What do you expect from your partnerships? Collaboration. What is that? How do you define collaboration? Collaboration is uh, like, you know, I understand what our goals and objectives are. Um, you know, whether it's an agency or whether it's a partner, you know, everyone has their own objectives and their own goals. And so for us, it's about finding a way for both parties to achieve. And then you can showcase that strength of partnership. And when something goes out the door, I want people, it needs to be authentic. It needs to be real. And I don't want to waste anyone's time with a piece that's just about me or just about them. And in our choice with, uh, you know, with, with chemistry, going out the you know initially working with them uh it was wonderful to get this quote outside perspective i'm doing these air quotes a lot today. no no i think that's i think that's a great point too you know it, it's good it brings perspective back because you know we're, we're looking at stuff yes we're gathering insights but to be able to bounce ideas off someone else and it's a group that's located here in atlanta that understands atlanta which was very very helpful for us when you're launching a brand in a city that i'm not from um to help understand how the city works to you know get connected with you know, people that can can great. help and support. Right. So they've been a gift from a, a creative perspective. And, yeah. you know, it's a constantly evolving market. You know, the sports industry is, is fast-paced, and, and they have been very, very helpful and forward-thinking and keeping us ahead of the curve. Can we talk – I have a couple more questions. So let's talk about community causes and taking a stand. Um, do, 
like pride and those kind of things, those discussions come up. Is there a club position on advocating for social issues? Uh, does the league have a position on it? Where, look, can we talk about that? That's a big question. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a lot of different directions we can go in. I think the first thing is it goes back to, you know, as a brand, knowing who you are and what you stand for. And so for us, we've got our five pillars of character. It's unity, determination, excellence, innovation, and community. So community is one of them. Uh, and, you know, those are essentially our morals and values. And we're fortunate enough to have a, you know, an owner that, is all about giving back. I mean, that is that is everything to him and leaving that legacy. And so we were able to launch the Atlanta United Foundation, which is dedicated to you know growing the game and increasing the access to the sport in the state of Georgia. Um, so when it comes to our foundation, we make sure that the community side, we've got a great community relations group. Um, you know, we make sure that that consistent marketing me- message is also felt through the community relations side. So when we're out in the field, they're still seeing that same brand and getting that connection, and it's authentic and it's real. And, you know, for, for them, you know, they've got some of their own initiatives and their own projects that they're working on, but they all tie back to the club mm-hmm. and what we're all trying to do. The league, you know, has some outstanding initiatives, too. This week you're going to start seeing the Greener Goals campaign uh, that we all support in. And, again, like I said before, we're all, we're all in this for something greater than ourselves. And so to be able to tie in and amplify our voice through some of the league initiatives is outstanding. Um, it's also a great way for us to learn and, and see what else is out there, too. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, we're truly committed to growing the game and increasing the access to the sport in this area. I just had this vision in my mind, just thought of this. Would there, this I'm, I don't care what the answer is. And you might not have an answer to this. Okay. But would it ever be the thing where, like, you would put just a picture on Instagram for Gay Pride Week where the five stripes are a rainbow. Is that something the club would ever consider doing? Is that the kind of position you want to take? Because I know that there's sort of a division in the fan base that says, you know, keep it about soccer. But then there's also sort of this pull with being supportive of the community. Is that something that would ever happen? Is that, and I, I don't care what the answer is. I'm just curious if that, those discussions come up. Yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, Atlanta is a city that is found in diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, what makes you know, makes us stronger, or what makes us different makes us stronger. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so... That's a pretty progressive position. I I agree with you. (laughs) I mean, it's... it's, I would hope that people believe that. It's true, though. I mean, and if you look at our mantra of unite and conquer, uh, you know, it's about... Unite stands for the fans. It stands for the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know... So you don't know it's a good good non-answer. Yeah, it's a good non-answer. But, you you know, unite... I mean, it's, it's not that... You know, it's a city that's found in diversity, and we're a reflection of the city. And so for us to make sure that we are inclusive and that, you know, we listen and respond to, you know, what the city wants and what the city needs and what the fans need is really, really important. And it's a very good it's – a, it's a good question to, to maybe not answer directly because it is a slippery slope. Because if we do it for that, then what slope. do we do for every single thing that comes up? So And, yeah, you, I mean, you never know. That's a – you know, we're, you never know. It's something that you're, they're constantly evaluating. It's not a yes, it's not a no. Right. But right like here. I said, it's, you know, Atlanta United is about it's unite and conquer. So we unite together and then we, you know. It's great. We're an unapologetic, an un- bold and unapologetic brand. So we're going to try some things. It's great. Okay. Now that the season's in full swing, what has surprised you? What has surprised me? What has happened that you're like, oh my God? Ah. Uh, like I said, last year, we were really focused on creating a culture. And the key word there is creating. When the, at that first game, standing there in, amongst all the chaos, that's when I realized we weren't creating, we were unleashing. Very cool. Because you see all of these fans coming out. I am not believe the number of fans. Oh, and not the fans, red, black, and gold all over the city. It was a swarm. A sw- it was unreal. And to stand there and to see that is when you realize... I'm not in the business of selling tickets. I'm not in the business of selling product. I'm in the business of creating a club that everyone wants to be a part of and can be a part of. And to see the people of Atlanta come out unleashing their passion and pride for the city and for the sport and being willing to take that risk on something new like this was absolutely unbelievable. And the city is like a best-kept secret. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. Well... My, my take on that first two games is I'm from Atlanta, and I know that Atlantans like to say they were there. I was there at the first game. They all want to be at the first game, and I know they're going to fill it to the top row at right. the first game. 
But when he came back out for Chicago, it was and it was the exact same standing for the entire still game. Still turned up all the way to the right of the knob. Couldn't have been turned up any higher for the entire game. I'm like, wow, this is a uh, we're going to sell out the season. Like it's, it's marketing pretty- doesn't have a job to sell tickets. Well, it's not my job anyway. It's right. not, I'm not in the business of selling tickets. Well, that's that's a very good point for you to say out loud because people had I'd asked for some questions and some of them were talking about those kind of things and uh, that's not that's not advertising's job. Advertising's job is to manage the brand and who you are and how you communicate with and understand. And it's, yeah, you, it's about creating a, a club. I mean, that's what marketing's job is: is to create a cu- club and and create a culture that you know people want to be a part of and can be a part of and then ensuring that the message is consistent just like any relationship we look for consistency in a relationship yeah. and a byproduct of that success is you know people wanting to show up and rally around the team at you know big moments like games it's awesome all right so last couple of questions one's from a good friend john murnane season ticket holder um how does the club think about marketing players versus the team seems like the club is more marketing a, a the team than a player, but just wondering now that there's an opportunity to, to actually do some communication around the players. Has, um, that, has that been discussed? It's definitely been discussed. Uh, as we know, players come and go, and so you want the loyalty of the club to remain the same. And this is why I never white, buy shirts with names on them. <laughs> 17, Atlanta. That's your shirt. That'd be my shirt. That's my birthday. It's my son's birthday. There you go. So it's 17 is our day. number anyway. Special yeah. number for the city. Yeah, yeah. Um, As if anybody cares what my birthday is, whatever. So what month? July. July 17th, people. Mm-hmm. Send them fan mail. <laughs> um, you know, fans, it's up to us to, to spread, you know, the more touch points the fans have with different players, the more opportunity there is to connect. Mm. And so for us, it's really, really important. Everyone has a story and to showcase their stories and to make sure that we spread that across all the different players. But the same thing with the fans, too, that we're telling fan stories because they're a part of the club just as much as players are. Without the fans, you wouldn't have a club. Without the players, you wouldn't have the, the club. So you, yep. they're, you, know, you need both of them. So for us, uh, there's a, we are mindful of focusing on one or two or three players uh, and making sure that we create or help you know create an environment that the loyalty remain the same regardless of what players are on the pitch. Yeah, that's I think that's cool. Um, speaking of players, Will Thompson, um, the writer in New York, asked a question. So, as a club, um, you try to attract world class talent. Does the does your marketing group ever advertise to prospective talent that you're scouting? Is there any sort of internal? pieces that maybe someone would take if they're trying to recruit a player. Is that part of the role here, sort of more of a B2B sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit. You know, we, we support the technical side, which is the, you know, the Carlos Bocanegra, the mm-hmm. Paul McDonough. Um, we definitely support that side. And Darren and Carlos and Paul have done an excellent job in creating a roster that is, is young, exciting, and, and on, on the up. Um, anytime you're building, you know, a new business or a new brand, you know, you got to entice talent. you got to want to get people to come and take that risk to be a part of something new. And it takes a special person who's willing to make that risk or take the risk. So, yes, we do provide support. Were you guys involved in the academy pieces? Yes, we were. That love was it. The academy? Love them. Uh, well, you love the academy. Well, my son tried out for the U-12s. Made Last it to, year? Made it to the final round. Yep. So we get this box in the mail yes. that says, that's branded on the outside. And inside is this gold embossed card that says, you've been chosen with... And then two days later, a full training kit came. Yes. So cool. Yes. I'm like, oh, my God, this club. Did someone give you all the secrets invo- to make me smile? Were you involved with like all you that? You get the spike in the videos. Yeah. Well, I'm a fan. And, and now you've, got, you've talked about the academy. It's, it's the foundation of the club. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the MLS, one of the things that you know, is really exciting is about their, uh, one of the many things, is their commitment to developing the next generation of talent. And their relationship with U.S. Soccer and the Development Academy. So, you know, the the future faces of our pro team, our first team, are found in the academy. Um, it's exciting. There, Atlanta is always in this southeast region; has always been a hotbed for talent. And by having the academy, you know, you're able to create like an aspirational focus for these aspiring players. Yeah, it's uh, You know, and so they can come together just like an AP classroom. When you put a bunch of really talented, smart kids together, they're going to challenge each other and become mm-hmm. better. So this training environment that's been created with the academy and having access to the first team, 
is is outstanding. Um, it's an environment like no other. They get access to all the same resources. Um, you know, with launching the academy, we made a commitment to launch the academy before the first team because it is a statement that, of the importance of yeah, that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And we were actually the first club, our first MLS club, to launch the academy before our, yeah, our first team. And, you know, the academy is, again, it's a representation of the city. It takes a lot of, there's a lot of people, as you know, being a soccer parent. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that sacrifice to help their kid get to that level. So there's, mm-hmm. you know, youth coaches, there's the parents, there's the siblings, and we have made sure and we've got a commitment to making sure that our academy is a celebration of all the clubs in Atlanta, not just us. Yeah, I realize as a soccer parent, it's not the kid that's committing. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. So speaking as a parent um, to the other parents, what, for you, for your life and your career, what was the value of playing competitive team sports <clears throat> through college into, into a professional career? Uh, is there anything that translates to your role now? Every single day. How? Uh, yeah, I think we're all born with a... a an internal drive to succeed uh you know and for me as a female females male brains obviously are very very different but as a female it's very easy to you know kind of fall off and doubt yourself you know females we have a tendency to do that and for me team sports was something that it helped me with that confidence it helped take that you know hyperactivity I had and that drive and and be able to focus and set goals and understand where I wanted to go and it goes into the whole road mapping thing figuring out where do I want to go how, what do I need to do in order to get there and then being able to function within a team and understanding your role and staying in your lane so you know for me it, depending on what team I was on if I was the center midfielder if I was a flank player like understanding what my role was and doing it to the best of my possible my ability was what sport taught me and, and the same thing transcends here so I've got the marketing role uh, marketing team and understanding what my role is and in order to succeed I've got to do the best I can and that then you'll see it in the club can I ask a personal question maybe so when you have a, a career ending injury uh, did, how do you handle transitioning out of the, out of sports into you're talking about the neck life? injury yeah ah that's a great story um, so story for another day probably was it, but was it a difficult thing to, did you sort of say well forget it, there goes that, or you're like, okay, now what? Like, how did it affect you yeah. psychologically? Um, because the reason I'm asking is that, that things happen in careers. You know, bosses leave, and then the whole place falls apart. Or a client leaves an agency, and you lose your job. And those are sort of these seminal moments in people's lives where they either take what they've done and transition, or they fall apart a little bit. And how did you handle that transition? Uh, we all have a choice. You have a choice to move forward or you have a choice to look back. And for me, it was definitely challenging, but you know, when I, I broke my neck and I realized the gravity of the situation and realized that, okay, you could take a risk and you could continue to play again. Or as my mom looked at me and said, when I was in the hospital bed after surgery, she was, mm-hmm. do you want to pick up your hypothetical children one day? And I may or may not have cursed her out in my head for saying that, but she was right. And it was, you've got a choice here. You can choose to open and you know write a new chapter or you can choose to you know kind of lament that that one is closed and you know I made a choice it took a little time to get through it all but I definitely made a choice it's time to move forward and it's time to discover myself outside of the of soccer I actually left the game for a little while and it's funny how the game just creeps back in and sucks you sucks you in and you realize you know I realized how much good it did for me in my life and that you know part of in my professional career was being able to give back to the sport so here I am. Great. Final question I ask every guest on the podcast. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back to the day you graduated from Wake Forest. Shoot. Whisper something in young Sarah Kate's ear. What would you say to yourself? Have fun. Like, don't forget to look up and enjoy these moments. It's great. It's great. Thank you so much for talking. Thank really you. I appreciate it. Listeners, make sure... <clears throat> You're getting choked up, aren't you? I okay. choked you up. Yeah. Listeners, make sure to like the Facebook page. I've got links to everything on there, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast. Atlanta United is available on the internet, atlutd.com, and on the website there are links to all the social media. I strongly recommend that you follow Atlanta United on social media. You can reach me, as always, at danspodcast at mac.com. I'll be back in two weeks. This has been a thrill for me, the confluence of my worlds, advertising and love for Atlanta United. Skate, thank you again so much. Thank you. Listeners, thank you guys. We'll see you again in two weeks. Till then, bye.
I want to be. I feel like someone someday needs to interview you. Can we do a podcast where you get interviewed? Um, episode 250 was that, exactly. It's like two, ep- two episodes back. So you're saying I missed an episode. I'll do another one, though. You're saying I missed it. Happy to do it. You've missed all of them. I just ate my foot, didn't I? <laughs> you're not-